In this lecture, we are going to talk about the process of organizational change and how can we help a certain organization go through the process of changing okay, in a way that it will be accepted by the members and executives of that, of that organization. Okay, so let's begin our discussion. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about organizational development is how to manage change, okay? Because for some reason, an organization would have to undergo change at least once or twice in your stay in a certain company, you will experience organiza organizational change or development. Okay, so how do we manage this change? So not all changes are expected. So some changes may, may be unexpected they may um we may not be prepared for it okay so now it means that changes can take on many forms the first example is that there might be a need for organizational development because of downsizing reorganization or the introduction of teams so let's what's the meaning of these three so the first one is downsizing maybe there's a need to reduce the number of employees due to the losses financial losses in a certain company so if there's a need to reduce a number of employees then it means that the employees who will remain in an organization would have to perform the jobs that were used to be performed by someone else so there there is a need for a sudden training because from now on you will be performing um great a greater number of tasks in other words there is a sudden job enlargement or next, there could be what we call reorganization. What if from a centralized organization, you became decentralized? And what is the meaning of that? You used to get all commands from the top management, but when they decided to be decentralized, they was, there was a spread in power. So they empowered the lower level managers so that these managers can decide on their own, even without consulting the top management. Okay, so there needs to be um, preparation for that as well. Because what if not all these managers are equipped with the right skills to manage a team on their own? Okay, and the introduction introduction of teams. What if there's a sudden need to form task force or teams in your company? Like in our company, there was a sudden need to to form a team that will check the quality of the services delivered by the organization okay there may be a sudden need for training because if you're going to form a team then the people who will be part of the team needs to undergo training to make sure that they possess the right skills to perform the functions of the team other than that some changes are also results of external mandates like managed care or new government regulations so what if because of the decision of the government, there's a need for, you know, um, changes in the way that you run things. What if there's a need to, there's a need um, in changes when it comes to compensation or there's a change in the labor law. Okay, so you need to inform people about these changes. Okay, say for example, because of governmental decisions in the country, schools need to adapt to online learning. So starting this year, 2020, we need to be um face-to-face -face learning is no longer allowed hence we need to move on to online learning so that's a change due to governmental um, decisions of the government and lastly there are other changes that occur due to new leadership or new personnel what if there's a sudden change in the ceo in the certain company if the company will change its president or ceo then we can also assume that the plans of that organization would have to change. Okay, say for example, a new president can decide will he or she continue the plan that was started by the previous president or is there a need for a new plan? Okay, so these are just some of the various reasons that may instigate change in the organization. So how can we manage these changes? The first thing that you can do in managing change is to do a sacred cow hunt okay so what is the meaning of a sacred cow hunt so a sacred cow hunt is an organization-wide attempt to get rid of practices that serve no useful purpose okay 
In a sacred cow hunt, an organization looks at all of its practices and policies and asks questions like these. Why are we doing it? What if it didn't exist? Is it already being done by someone else? How and when did we start doing this? Can it be done better by another person, department, or company? Okay, so if there's a sacred cow hunt, there is an attempt to get rid of practices that are no longer useful so that you will be more efficient in your processes. See, for example, when I was in college, I was, you know, there, I was overwhelmed by, num by the number of paperwork that you need to secure in order for you to use a room in the school. And we typically reserve rooms for our events, for our psychological experiments, for our classes. And then as the one who is tasked to reserve these rooms, usually I would say, why is there a need to fill up all of these papers if this room will only be used for one and a half hour? Okay, one and a half hours. Okay, so I think back then that this is an example of a sacred cow. So why are you doing this? Is this just because you've been doing this for quite some time? So maybe there's a need to do this in a better way. So I just noticed that one year after that, they started adapting an online room reservation um, um, policy. Okay, so they no longer require students to fill up pieces of paper, forms of paper, that have the same contents again and again, but rather they move on to an online reservation system, which is better, okay? Another type of a sacred cow that I think is continually hampering the efforts of people is in the Philippines, there's a need to secure 28 permits for you to construct a cell tower. And because we don't have that much cell towers in the Philippines, the speed of the internet and the speed of connections in the mobile uh, the speed of mobile connection is not that fast. That's why there's a need for more cell towers. But in order for you to create more cell towers, you need to create 28, you need to secure 28 permits. Now you can ask questions such as, is it really needed for you to secure 28 permits? Or is it is there a better way to do this? Because securing those 28 permits will take one year to do so. Okay, can't we do it online? I guess the present situation helped us realize that there are practices that needed to be changed, okay, such as being physically present and filling up all types, all forms of, you know, hard copies, because in the first place, you, this could have been done online. So these are examples of sacred cows. So there are three types of sacred cows in an organization, and the first one is what we call paper cow. So when we say paper cow, these are unnecessary paperwork, usually forms, reports that cost organizations money to prepare, distribute, and read. Okay, and in order for you to know that this form or paper is a paper cow, you need to ask questions if someone actually reads the paperwork. So ask questions like, why am I receiving this? Okay, because perhaps due to organizational practices, your objective is to write a certain report every week but even without the report your unit will be able to do its job okay so that's a paper cow that's an unnecessary paperwork so going back to my experiences when i was in college there's a lot of paperwork to secure if you have an event or you have a program sometimes sometimes you just ask questions such as isn't there a way to do this online do we really need to be there to ask for their signatures one by one just for this document to be submitted? Okay, so that's a paper cow because um, the papers are so redundant and at the end of the day, it's not really being read. It's not really being utilized by the people who are involved in this process. Okay, so just in order for you to know if it's a paper cow, then try not receiving that paper for, let's say, a short period of time and then if you did not look for that then it means that it's not necessary okay so try um, not receiving that paper try not requiring that form for a short amount of time and just observe if you're going to look for it or not so good annual practice is to review all forms reports and determine whether they're still needed okay and if they're still needed are they needed in the current format? 
Can we make a format that is easier to fill up, easier to accomplish? Is there a need to fill up some paperwork if we can do it with a computer? Okay, because there are a lot of institutions, companies who require their clients to fill up the paperwork manually. But at the end of the day, all of these can be done with the use of a computer. Okay, so I remember one time we had this one speaker in health psychology and then he compared the Philippine health system to the health system overseas. And he noticed that the shortcoming in the Philippine health system is that every time that you go to a hospital, you need to fill up the same sheets of paper that you fill up in another hospital. Unlike in other countries, there's a health system wherein you just have to say your name and then the, they're going to look for your name in the database. And this database is shared from different companies, different organizations, so that you no longer have to fill up or to put the same information because that's only a waste of time. Okay, so that's one way of addressing a paper cow. Okay, in a, and in that example, that was done in the healthcare system. The next type of a sacred cow in a company is what we call a meeting cow. So when we say meeting cow, this is the number and length of meeting. So you need to ask questions such as, how many meeting time was spent doing business as opposed to socializing because there are times wherein you say that it's a meeting but in reality you're not talking about business you're socializing with each other so if you wasted one hour socializing that one hour could have been dedicated to doing other more important things okay so the bottom line is this you should ask questions such as was the meeting really necessary Okay, is there a need for you to go to the office to attend the meeting? Is there a need for you to be online for this meeting? Or can that meeting be simply an email? Okay, so meeting cows or meetings, typically they consume time even though um, it's just sometimes this meeting is just a waste of time. So you need to review um, the length and numbers of your meetings. Okay, maybe it's more um, efficient if you keep your meeting short and not so frequent as it used to be. Okay, to, so to reduce the number and length of meetings, some organizations ask the person calling the meeting to determine the cost of the meeting. So that's one way to do it. Okay, and in some organizations, the meeting costs are actually posted at the beginning of the meeting. So are we going to spend 1,000 pesos in this meeting, 2,000? And that's one way for you to convince yourself that you are spending too much or you're doing too much meeting. Because at the end of the month, you're going to realize that you spent around 10,000 pesos just providing food during meetings. And that's one way to convince yourself that this number and length of meeting is no longer necessary and you can keep it short and simple. <laughs> Next is what we call speed cow. When we say speed cow, this refers to the unnecessary deadlines. Okay, because most of the time, supervisors or managers would say that the work needs to be done by tomorrow. Okay, they like this word by tomorrow, by tomorrow, by tomorrow. However, this deadline may not be necessary because that certain paperwork. It's not really due tomorrow. It could have been submitted next week. But because you always like to require something to be done by tomorrow, you are overworking your subordinates. Okay, Unnecessary deadlines cause employees to work at a faster than optimal pace, resulting to a decrease in quality, increased stress, and increased health problems. So what you need to do is ask yourself, is it really needed that this file be submitted tomorrow? Or can we extend the deadline until next week? Okay. Of course, you want your subordinates to work hard every now and then, but it may not be necessary to do it every day. Okay, so after talking about sacred cows, now let's talk about how can we make employees accept the change that is happening in the organization. Change can be beneficial, like what we're doing right now. We are adapting online learning. However, not everyone is enthusiastic about change and they are reluctant to change. Okay? And that is understandable because employees are comfortable doing things the old way. 
they may fear that change will result in less favorable working conditions and economic outcomes than they are used to, but that may not be the case all the time. Okay, and employees may also fear that their skills may not be enough or may not be valued in the future, and they might worry about whether they can adapt to the new changes. That's why you need to take steps in order for you to make your employees feel that even though we are undergoing organizational change, your skills or your commitment would still be valuable to the company. Okay. So here is one theory of change, and this one was according to Kurt Lewin, and according to him, there are three major stages in organizational change, namely these are unfreezing, moving, and refreezing. So let us define them one by one. First, when we say unfreezing, this is the stage wherein organizations must convince employees and other stakeholders that the current state of affairs is unacceptable and that change is necessary. Say, for example, as a school, we needed to convince the professors and we needed to convince the students that right now face-to-face -face classes is not the best option when it comes to schooling. So we must embrace online classes. However, they would not necessarily embrace online classes if they think that there's nothing wrong with it. That's why we need to create a dissatisfaction first about face-to-face -face classes. And what is that dissatisfaction? We just basically um, use the narrative that face-to-face -face classes may expose students to the COVID, um, to, the, to the coronavirus. That's why in order for us to avoid unnecessary exposure, then we should adapt online methods of learning. And with that, we were able to convince people that maybe online classes is the better option. However, I can say that until now, not everyone is convinced about this online learning because even though we are conducting online learning, I would say that not all teachers and not all students are very comfortable with this. And I would guess that there are some teachers who lost their jobs because their skills are not good enough for the online learning that we are adapting right now. Okay, so these are all parts of the organizational development process, okay? And the next thing that you're going to do is, after you create dissatisfaction with the current culture, you need to move to the new culture. So you need to take steps. If you're adapting online classes, you need to train people. You need to let them know about the new work processes, okay? You need to move to the desired state, okay? You cannot create dissatisfaction about the old culture and stay in that culture. Okay, and then finally, if you were able to get to your desired state, then we can, you know, refreeze. Okay, so in the stage of refreezing, you develop ways to keep the new changes. You formalize new policies, such as in the past few months, our university has released a lot of memorandums, a lot of policy manuals, a lot of new entries to the manual that was used to that was um, to the original manual and this time they included policies about online learning and other than that we can reward employees for behaving in a manner consistent with the new change so online learning um, with online learning what if the executives in a certain school can reward good employee behaviors for um, embracing online learning what if those people who have good online classrooms will be rewarded then your employees and then your um, clients would also be enthusiastic about embracing this change, okay? Just like with the COVID-19 pandemic, we are rewarding people who wear their face masks, their face shields, etc. Because that's the new normal and we need to refreeze into this new normal until um, it's no longer necessary to adapt this certain culture or climate. Okay, so... Those are the stages according to Kurt Lewin, but this time, let's take a look at another perspective, and this one was according to Carnal. And according to him, there are five stages that employees go through during change. And look at this. The first one is denial, okay? So whenever there's organizational change, employees deny that change would actually occur. So say, for example, teachers may say that I, they don't believe that we need to adapt online learning this upcoming semester. So we just need to um, stick with the old ways. And there's, don't worry because I don't think that 
online learning will be the new normal. There's no way that that will push through. We will go back to the old normal um, just a few months from now. I don't believe that we will adapt online learning, okay? And we might say things like, we tried that before and it didn't work. Something like that won't work in a company like ours. So they, they deny. They don't believe that change will really occur. However, if change is inevitable, they then they will move from stage one to stage two. And that stage two is what we call defense. Okay, in the stage of defense, what you do is um, the employees, they become defensive if they think that change is really going to happen and they try to justify their old ways. They say that there's nothing wrong with face-to-face -face classes or they say that there's nothing wrong with not adapting online learning and they try to say that their way of doing things still works, okay? If an organization is changing the way in which employees perform, then there's an inherent criticism that employees must have previously been doing things wrong. So because of online learning, okay, we suddenly change the way that professors perform the job. So we cannot avoid the mentality that professors may think inherently that Maybe there's something wrong with the way that I used to teach. That's why they, they are changing the way that things are supposed to be done. However, we do know that that is not really the case. In that case, um, we're just changing the way that we deliver the service, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with you. And these are some expected behaviors in the stage of defense. Okay, They try to be reactive and defensive to what, information they're going to hear okay and that's a normal stage that employees go through whenever there's organizational change and along the way they become more open about change the third and fourth one are discarding and adaptation so when we say discarding they are at the stage we're in they begin to realize not only that the organization is going to change but as employees they need to change as well so from an organizational level they begin to realize that i sh i myself must adapt this change in order for the organization to keep moving forward i need to follow the vision of the company okay if this if our company will be known as the number one school in online learning then i myself should be equipped with the skills needed to deliver online education okay so that is discarding you began to realize that you need to change as well and then eventually the good news is that you learn how to adapt in the stage of adaptation employees test the new system and they learn how it functions they begin to make adjustments in the way they perform and they spend tremendous amount of energy at this stage professors are trying to learn we are trying to try the new normal we're trying online learning, even though this is, this is not our comfort zone. And at this stage, we spend a lot of time becoming frustrated and angry because we're not so used to the way that we do things now that we spend a lot of energy trying to adapt to this stage that we become frustrated and angry at ourselves, at the company, or at the environment, or at the situation. Okay, And that's a normal stage in doing organizational change but eventually you'll become used to what is happening and that is stage five in stage five or internalization employees become immersed in the new system or the new culture and you become comfortable with the new system and you have accepted new co-workers if there are new co-workers and the new work environment so right now it's it's important for all the workers out there to accept the fact that they are working from home and that they may not be able to communicate or relate or spend time with their co-workers that much unlike before and we need to accept the new normal and that is the stage of internalization then eventually we become comfortable with what we're doing with work from home and then we, be we become efficient in the new system that we have adapted okay so those are the five stages of organization of of changes of um, the five stages that employees go through during an organizational change denial defense um discarding adaptation and then internalization
All right, so this time let's take a look at the person undergoing the change and there are different people, different types of persons whenever there is organizational change. Of course, their behaviors um, is determined by individual differences and their experiences will contribute on how enthusiastic they are when it comes to organizational change. So here are the following. First, we have what we call change agents or they are the people who enjoy change and they make changes just for the sake of it. The downside of being a change agent is that he or she may be changing something that is not really needed to be changed. They just want something new all the time, although it's not really healthy to change all the time. Okay, so it may be good to work with them at first, but eventually you will, you will realize that they don't know how to stick to a single plan and they change their mind very quickly. That's why you won't be able to accomplish a long-term goal because for them, there's no such thing as long-term goal because they always adapt new short-term goals. Okay, You don't want people to fall in love so much with change to the point that there's no, you don't, um, you don't know anymore the direction that you are taking. Okay, other than that, we also have what we call change analysts. And when we say change analysts, there are the people who analyze change. They are not afraid to change. They make changes if necessary, but they only make changes if the changes will improve the organization. So unlike change agent, change agents, change analysts are people who think first before embracing change. They're not, they can change if it's necessary. But if it's not needed, then they're not going to implement it because some changes will not be helpful. Some changes are actually harmful to the organization. Okay, that's why um, you need to, you know, classify yourself and be aware of the different types of change um, of people during change, and just to find balance between uh, between being enthusiastic about change and thinking about the consequences of changing. We also have what we call receptive changers. So when we say receptive changers, they are people who will not instigate change, but they are willing to change. It means that receptive changers are not leaders. They are subordinates. They are not change. They do not lead change. They do not lead the organization. But if you tell them to change, they are willing to do so. Okay, so they are the obedient um, subordinates. Next, we do have people who don't like change that much and they are the reluctant changers. They will not welcome change, but they will change if that is necessary. Okay, so they're not so happy about it, but if it's necessary for them to move on by embracing the new normal in their company, then that will be no problem for them. However, of course, you do not want to work with someone who is a change resistor because a change resistor is someone who hates change. They are scared by change and will do anything that they can to keep change from occurring. Okay, so you don't want to be surrounded by people who are change resistors because if you want them to adapt a new system, then you will hear nothing but criticisms about this new system. Okay, maybe it's good to work with change analysts and re receptive changers, but not so much with change agents and change resistors. So I suggest that if you're going to make a team, to make a team who will handle change organizational development, then um, they need to be trained in the process of change as well, so that they will not easily embrace change even though it's not necessary. Okay, and then we also have what we call organizational culture, and we have to take note of organizational culture whenever there is organizational change. And when we say organizational culture, sometimes they also refer to corporate climate or um, corporate culture. And then an organizational culture is comprised or composed of shared values, beliefs, and traditions that exist among individuals in the organization. So basically, that's your collective value, that's your collective belief, that's your collective tradition, okay? So this is a collective belief about the company. Like, what do you say in your motto? So are you the company of, um, do you, are you a company that care about your clients? Are you a company, say for example, like, um, the company of BDO, their motto is that they find ways. So that's their corporate culture, that they will find ways about their 
about their um uh, they will find ways for their clients and help them so look at the motto of your favorite company and see if that is there that is the culture that they uphold okay now um let's talk about what can we do if we need to change the organizational culture and what are the steps that we need to take okay so if we need to change organizational culture it's not that easy okay making organizational changes doesn't necessarily mean though that everything about the existing culture must be changed okay so there are some aspects of the previous culture that you can you know retain okay which means that adapting online learning doesn't necessarily mean that you have to change everything about teaching you can still use your old materials you can still use your old methods but not all of them okay you have to discard some of them and adapt new ways of doing things so the first step in changing culture is assessing the desired culture so how comfortable are we about adapting online learning and let's compare it with the existing culture okay so like what i told you earlier you need to create dissatisfaction about the current culture and support the new one so that it can be maintained so here are the steps that you need to take in changing organizational culture just like in training organizational culture also needs um, needs assessment okay because parts of the existing culture may actually support the certain organizational changes then the current culture must be analyzed and compared with the desired culture to determine what might need to change okay so you need to analyze which aspects of the current job can be retained or which of them needed to be discarded in the new way that you're going to do things and then step number two determine the executive direction so management must analyze the needs um assessment to determine the decisions or actions that will reinforce the culture or to assess the feasibility of changes like right now what we're doing in the university is this yes we're doing online learning however it is expected it is not expected by our company that we will be able to adapt quickly hence the changes are being implemented step by step like right now even though we're doing online learning we allow our students to learn asynchronously so if you remember our term in training about asynchronous learning so we do not require all students to be online at the same time but rather you can learn at your own face we will just upload the materials online and then you can learn at your own face but we don't know what if eventually we adopt a synchronous approach maybe we will adopt a synchronous approach if um, the needs assessments say that we are ready to do so okay and then step number three is to implement consideration just like what i told you earlier this area addresses how a culture will be implemented will committees or ad hoc groups be set up to carry out changes or will management execute the changes in our case there's a committee formed to screen the materials that professors are uploading online and then this committee will implement the changes and then they will oversee the quality of the services being delivered in this change period and step four training okay but personally i think the training must come earlier but let's look at it this um for now it's okay to consider it at step four so or all organizational members must be trained in the new philosophy for the new culture to thrive and be long lasting of course if there's organizational change then there might be a need for new skills to be developed then training would be necessary and step number five evaluate the new culture so let's try to learn is this new culture beneficial is this new mechanism helpful to the organization and to our uh, to our clients okay so review the new culture issues as, such as whether the change actually has occurred or whether the old norms and procedures still exist should be addressed okay so those are the step-by-step -step procedures in doing organizational change okay and then let's talk about how how can we make our employees aware 
of the organizational culture. So there are different ways to communicate your organizational culture, such as number one, organizational socialization. When we say socialization, this is also known as orientation or job induction. This is the first training that you give to your new employees. And in the organizational socialization or orientation, you allow your employees to understand the culture of the company that they are applying for. Okay, so that as early as in their first day or in their first week, they'll be able to have an idea what's the mission of the company that, do, that they belong to. Other than that, we also have what we call rituals or procedures in which employees participate to become one of the gang. So this is more informal in comparison to socialization because when we say rituals, these are informal methods of what we call onboarding. Okay, so rituals may include... Um, being included in the company outing or being included in the in the dinner of the company being included in the lunch okay so those are little things that encourage um, employees to be comfortable in his new company and feel that he is indeed part of the gang and that is his welcome to the company moment and then the next is also what we call symbols okay so symbols are communication tools that convey messages to the employees so when we say symbols these are mottos logos colors so like for example a christian company may have a cross in every room a catholic school may have a crucifix in every room and that's how you communicate to your students that you do value religiosity and spirituality in your organization so that's how you can communicate organizational culture to everyone okay and then in the next discussion we are going to talk about um, we are going to talk about work arrangements and other related stuff to to organizational change such as empowerment